if people do it for free, they'll be like, I'll be there at three o'clock. Then if it rains, they'll be like, ah, I couldn't fuck up my hair. But if you charge people even $19.99, they'll be there because now they have something invested into Correct. it. Correct. And I noticed that with everything. <laughs> DJ Woodley on the set. What's up, bro? Envy. Yes, sir. Happy to have you. Thanks for having me, man. Um, asked you last season to come on. You promised me you would. Immediately, me hitting you, telling you you were coming back for season two. You said yes. Carved out the date, so thanks so much. Because I know your time is bananas. You are um, you're such a role model. And as I was thinking about questions to put together for you for this interview, I really got to look over your history. And you and I have been knowing each other for many years, but you kind of defy so many stereotypes in the world of, of hip hop. Um, family man, uh, educated, well-spoken, uh, successful. You, you, you just are such a role model. So where does that come from? Bring me back to the beginning of the DJ Envy story. Um, I think that, that came from a couple of things. One, my, my upbringing in Queens mm -hmm. and the fact that um, my dad was a, a police officer, retired police officer. My mother worked at Guardian Life Insurance and their main thing was education. I was the first person in my family to graduate and go to college. So, you know, for them, all they wanted for me was to graduate out of college. That's what they wanted to see. Um, and, and when I got into music, they didn't care. They was like, I just want you to get your education. Um, and that's what I did. I, I went to Hampton University. And uh, I just remember my parents, is, you know, their whole thing is, is my parents are like super duper black. Mm -hmm. Like everything is black, HBCU, chitlins on New Year's Eve, like <laughs> black. And, you know, they wanted me to go to HBCU. And, you know, we drove, you know, from New York, we did the, the run, the Morgan State to Howard, to Hampton, to Morehouse. And when I went to Hampton, I seen that beautiful campus on the water. I mean, we didn't have no water but Jones Beach, and that water wasn't blue. Mm -hmm. And um, it started from there. What made you choose Hampton out of all the HBCUs? That water. Really? Yeah, Morgan State didn't have that water, Howard didn't have that water, Morehouse didn't have that water, Hampton was, you know, home by the sea. It just looked beautiful. The weather was nice, it was a change from New York, so I, but it was close enough for me to get home. Okay. It was only a six hour drive, yep. so I said, I can do this. Yeah. And that's where I wanted to go. When you were in Hampton, is that where you got the DJ bug? No, I, I started DJing beforehand, so the story was, um, and this is why I always say influences are a, a major thing, especially in our community. So I used to take the bus to school when I was in Queens. Uh, I, would, I lived in Queens Village. Mm -hmm. uh, and I always used to say my zone school was Andrew Jackson. That's where LL was standing in front of the car. That was in front of the, that, that school. But that school was the, the worst school as a kid growing up. The first school in the world with metal detectors. So my parents were like, I don't want you to go to that school. My dad was like, I'll, I'll work overtime. My mother was like, I'll work overtime to pay for you to go to Catholic school. So I went to Catholic school at a school called St. Francis. And St. Francis is kind of like, it's crazy because you had to take four buses to get there. Mm -hmm. So I'd have to go through the hood, go through Jamaica Avenue to get to school. And you know, I had my Catholic school pants on and every day I would have to take the bus. And it was always cold, I didn't have a car. And I would just remember, I'm, I'm freezing, waiting at the bus stop and uh, I seen Ernesto. Ernesto had a, I don't know if it was a Honda Accord back then or a three series. For anyone watching. I'm tell him who Ernesto okay. is. And I knew Ernesto for playing basketball. We used to play basketball in the alley back in the day. And I ran over to Ernesto. He had a, a I don't remember if he had a Honda Accord. Back then, a Honda Accord was like a Bentley. You had yep. a Honda Accord, you was living. And I ran up to him, I said, yo, what you doing to get this money? And he was like, yo, come to my crib after school. So I'm thinking he's selling drugs. But at that time, I was like, look, I need some J's, I need whatever. <laughs> so I remember going to his house. He lived across the street from me. And his mother let me in. He was like, you know, Ernesto's downstairs. So I go downstairs, and when I go downstairs, I see records, I see tapes, cassettes, tape 
recorders, all types of stuff. I'm like, what, what's this? And he was like, I'm a DJ. And I was like, well, what's your DJ name? And he was like, DJ Clue. Whoa. And I didn't know for all this time that that was Clue, because at the time, Clue didn't have a face. He didn't want anybody to know who he was. He just used the question mark thing. And I'm like, you a DJ? And he was like, yeah. And I was like, you make all this money from DJ? He was like, yeah. Right then and there, I was like, I'm going to be a DJ. And it just, that was, that's where the DJ bug started. So Clue actually got you in the game. Absolutely. That's why I always show so much love to Clue. That's why, you know, people always say, like, you, you know, why you show so much love to Clue? Why mm -hmm. you don't let nobody talk bad about Clue? Because he gave me that, that door. And because of that, that's my brother. Can you help people understand, and what year are we talking now? This early uh, 90s? Yeah, this was early 90s. This, was, this was had to be about maybe like 92, 93. Can you help people understand in the room, but mm -hmm. this is obviously going to be shown um, on YouTube and around mm -hmm. the world, what Clue meant at that moment? I mean, Clue was the, the biggest. He was bigger than most artists out there. I mean, and nobody knew what this kid looked like. All he was was the question mark man. And if you were an artist, you wanted to get on a Clue tape. I don't care if you were Biggie, if you were Mace, if you were Nas, if you were Jay-Z, you wanted to get on that. He was the biggest thing for DJs back then, street and underground. And for him to live right across the street from me, the kid that I used to play ball with, mm -hmm. ride the bikes with, it was just like one of those things. And at the time, I was like, this is everything. This is what I want to do. So I would just go to him for information. Yo, what equipment do I need to buy? What do I need to do? And I remember he had, a, um, I needed a name. Mm -hmm. So at the time, I was five foot two. So I was like, Shrimp, DJ Shrimp. <laughs> and that was my name, DJ Shrimp. And I had a partner, and his name was DJ Mono. Mm -hmm. And Mono was the one that actually taught me how to DJ, taught me how to cut and scratch and flash and blend. He taught me that. And together, we went to an all-white school. So, it was, uh, you know, he was Haitian. And we used to say that people envied us in school. So together we were Envy Productions. Mm -hmm. So I was DJ Shrimp, he was DJ Mono, and on the tapes back in the day it used to say Envy. And uh, we never made no money, we just practiced and it, it was bad. And he was like, yo, I'm giving this up, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna mess with the girls. So I just stayed in the basement and practiced. I was a late bloomer, so I never really, I was shy, so I couldn't really kick at the chicks, I was really shy, so I was like, I'm just gonna do it. So when I would go pass out the tapes to all the African bootleggers, it said Envy on it. Mm -hmm. So they was like, oh, Envy, here, give me the new Envy. And it just kind of stuck, and I just went from shrimp to Envy and took off with Envy. Wow. And Clue literally lived across the street. Across the street from me. You getting into DJing, would you say looking back now, was it opportunity, was it money, or was it love? All of the above. All of the above. All of the above. It was, I mean, everybody loved music back then. Mm -hmm. I mean, I always say that era, the 90s, 2000, was the best era ever. So to get into music and, you know, when Puff was getting into it and, and Jay was getting into it and Dre and Snoop, it was just so much love, but there was so many things to do. This is when, you know, there was Philly Greek and Greek Fest and Jones Beach and Harlem 125th Street and Grant's Tomb and we would just go out and have a good time. And back then, it was no Rolls Royces and Bentleys, like, it was none of that. If you had a Honda Accord... You clean that Honda Accord, you put your little system in it, and you was rocking. Exactly. And that's what it was about. We, we just all had a good time. And, you know, the mixtape DJs were the soundtracks to the streets. Yep. Radio wasn't really playing that much hip-hop, so when you wanted to come to hip-hop, you came to the DJs. So it was, you know, Ron G, it was uh, uh, Kid Capri, it was Clue, it was me, it was Jade Lorello. It was all those DJs, SNS, that kind of was the soundtrack for the streets, and we kind of were the soundtrack. How long did you do mixtapes? Uh, I did mixtapes from that all the way through college, probably about six, seven years, eight years. Okay, so you did it straight through. So straight you through were, college. Because I remember the Envy mixtapes. Mm -hmm. You were in college when you were doing I it? I went to college and I used to drive back Friday night through the mixtapes and then drive back Sunday morning to be a class Monday morning. Wow. Yeah. How'd you distribute them? Um, well, the, the, be the, the dope thing about it is, since Clue is your neighbor, we both would share each other's machines. Uh -huh. So if he had 10 machines and I had three machines, we kind of would share it and we were able to duplicate all the machines and the CDs and everything just like that. And we would duplicate it. We would go to the stores ourselves and we would send out, you know, cash on delivery ourselves to these different stores. And we would do that, you know, once every two, three weeks. So that hustler mentality been in you for day one. Absolutely. What'd you major in? 
uh, business management and uh, marketing? Most people take majors that they never use in real life. Right. Has your major served you? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Like, you know, me going to college, I knew I was going to be rich. Mm -hmm. And most people would have took communications to learn how to do radio or learn music or learn this. But nobody could teach me music because I, I was in it. I was living it. But I always thought when I get there, how am I going to learn what to do with my money? How am I going to market myself? So I took those marketing and business classes, and that's where I focused my degree on. And I just used that to help my business. So for instance, and no disrespect to any DJ that's watching this, but back in the day, if you think about it, right, all DJs were fat. Yep. That's true. true 100%. I'm not going to name them, but they were all overweight. I mean, we can name them. You can, actually, you can go the other way and try to name the ones who weren't fat, and you'll right. probably have five. So I was like, I need to do something different than what they're doing. They already have a good fan base. So they were catering to the street dudes, right? The hustlers, the bottles. So I said, you know what? I'm going to go the other way. Now, if you look at those DJs, if you go back and look at the old pictures, it was always sloppy, big T-shirts, horrible looking sneakers. And I said, you know what? I'm going to be the fly DJ. I'm going to cater to women. I'm going to cater to the females. I'm going to have a bunch of females at my club because mine is going to be sexy and dope and we're going to be fly. I'm going to have the newest joint jeans on, the hottest shirt this, that, and the other, jewelry. I'm going to look like a rapper. And what happened was I used to do all these parties and I used to have nothing but women in them. And at first, promoters would be like, yo, we're not making no money because there's nothing but women in there. <laughs> and then what happened? All the street hustlers was like, nah, we don't want to party over there. We're going to party with Envy because yeah. Envy got the women. And it just caught on. And that's how I kind of created my style different than anybody else. I like what you said. And I think for anybody watching this, this is, this is something that people should really pay close attention to. You said, I always knew I was going to be rich. Yeah. And you're so forward thinking that even before you broke, even before you become this household name, you're now thinking of your own brand. Right. You're seeing what's out there in the marketplace and saying to yourself, hey, you know what? All of the DJs, they're overweight. They you know, are not necessarily the greatest dresses, mm -hmm. I'm going to cater to a different fan base. Correct. Where did this forward thinking come from? I want it to be different. And I'm kind of different, like, some people, they, they hate on other people and they're mad, but I aspire to be better than them. Mm -hmm. And it's not on no hate, it's on, it's on this is what I want to do. So like I tell everybody all the time, when I used to get lazy or unmotivated, I would drive to the richest area in Long Island, because I'm from Queens, and I would just look at those big ass mansions, look at them big ass, but one day I'm gonna own that, I'm gonna own a house like that. And that would give me my motivation, because I was like, I'm not in that house right now. You know, and, and that's what I did, and that was my motivation, to, to keep pushing, to keep working, and I knew that I couldn't be like everybody else. I couldn't do the things that everybody else is doing. I had to make myself a little different. Mm -hmm. So when I came out, you know, one of my, my, my AKAs was DJ me something like a rapper. Mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. I was like, I got your jewels like I a rapper, remember. I got the cars like yeah. the rapper. But that's what I was, and people took me as such. So now when I walk into the club, a promoter treats me differently than he treats another DJ. Yo, right away, yo, I need a spot in the front, I need a table, I need this, that, and the other. They're like, you're not a rapper, but well, this is what I need. And they started giving it to me. So they treat you different. They make sure your money's there as soon as you walk in. And it's a different feeling, it's a different way of marketing myself. And then I just took that whole mentality around the country. So for anybody who's starting off in business, because you're, that's some, that's balls. Like you're asking for stuff that you have to earn your way. Like mm -hmm. you, you have to earn that rider. Right. I want a spot in the front. I want my drinks. I want this. When did you say to yourself, you know what? I have to walk the walk. If, if I'm going to be treated a certain way, I, I, I can't be scared to ask for what I want. Right. I mean, I think for myself, I walk the walk. Like, I was out there on 125th Street selling CDs and tapes to Africans. I was driving down to Virginia Beach, 4th of July, giving out mixtapes and, and CDs. You know, I was waiting outside of record labels, waiting for, uh, you know, somebody to give me a record. So I did that. So when I started getting a name, I'm like, I got to make myself bigger than Clue. I got to make myself bigger than SNS. I got to make myself bigger than Ron G, than Kid Capri, than Funkmaster Flex. I got to make myself bigger than them. How am I going to do it? They all had their niche. They all had their lanes. I got to get my lane. 
and that's what it was. Yeah, but you want to know something? A lot of them walk that walk. Mm -hmm. Whether it's in DJ, any walk of life, mm -hmm. you can't be afraid to ask mm -hmm. for what you want. You Correct. can't be afraid to see yourself and then go after it aggressively and demand that people treat you the way that you want to be treated. Absolutely. How'd you get off the um, streets from doing mixtapes to Hot 97? Um, well, college was the best thing that happened to me. Okay. And not just because of my degrees, because it opened me up to music that I didn't necessarily know. You know, when you got a roommate from Mississippi and a roommate from Atlanta and a roommate from New Orleans, they putting you on to all types of country music and country slang. So it opened me up to where now I'm not just getting booked in New York, I'm getting booked in Atlanta, South Carolina, North Carolina, that whole circuit. So um, Hot 97, and this is, this is the, the one good thing about being persistent. Hot 97 started doing this, something called Taking It to the Streets. Yep. Where every uh, weekend they get a, a new street DJ to DJ for four hours on the radio. So when they did it, they picked four DJs. DJ Who Kid, DJ K Slay, DJ Green Lantern, and DJ Threat. Didn't pick me. One of the reasons I felt like they picked me is because I was never in a DJ click. I was never clicked up. I was never a Desert Storm, I mean, a Desert Storm DJ. I was never a Big Dog Pitbull. I was never a heavy hitter. I never wanted to be. Mm -hmm. I wanted to create my own. So they didn't pick me. So I was like, all right. DJ Threat, I believe, got into a motor motorcycle accident and passed away. When he passed away, it opened the door for me. I was so persistent and so consistent. They was like, we got to give this kid Envy a try. And once I get in that door, I'm going, I'm going hard. And that's what I did. Now, are these the Thursday nights on Hot? No, this was uh, Saturday nights at Hot at the time. Okay. It's 12 to 4 a.m. I remember, and this is going back showing my age, but I remember the Monday night mixtape. That was Clue. That was Clue. Mm -hmm. You didn't come in through that. No. You came in through the Taking It to the yeah, Streets on Saturday. Streets, yep. Okay, how'd you go from Saturday nights? Mm -hmm. If I remember correctly, you go to Miss Jones in the morning? Well, first, before that, I started doing um, weekends. Mm -hmm. So I'm the type of person, when I get in that door, I want to know everything. So I, I get in the Hot 97 door, and I'm like, Tracy Clarity was the program director at the time. And I was like, I want to learn everything. I want to learn how to talk radio. I want to learn how the Vox Pro works and the machine works. I want to learn how to program music. I want to learn this, learn that. So I would just go to Hot 97 all day long. And she would teach me. And she was like, you know what, Envy? I'm going to give you... Uh, I'm going to let you try Sunday mornings early, uh, I think it was like 5 to 7 a.m. I was like, all right. I remember my first day, the fire alarm went off. Whew, so fire alarm was going off. So I'm like, shit, I don't know what to do. <laughs> they was like, you got to evacuate. So I didn't know what to do. So I put in a, a Mr. C. I had a Mr. C cassette. I just put in a Mr. C cassette and I ran out the building. <laughs> and she was like, Envy, what are you doing? I'm like, yo, police came. They was like, you never leave. I'm like, even if the building's on fire? No. <laughs> I was like, all right. And after that, I never left that radio. I, I started learning how to talk and how to tease. And yo, coming up in three minutes, we, we're giving away tickets to see Mob Deep. And we started learning that. Um, and then Star and Buck Wild had an incident on the radio where it just got nasty and they just wanted to leave. Mm -hmm. they, they, they wanted to leave. Um, so they was like, okay, we'll give, you, we'll give you a chance. We'll give you a chance to do radio. We need somebody in there that knows how to do radio. So they put me and Joe Button together. Joe Button was doing radio that, that, back then. So Joe Button, me and Joe Button did a radio show. And uh, Joe Button was dope. He was nice, but yep. he would just always be falling asleep. Like, he was, he's a rapper. Um, so they used him for a couple of months, and it was like, no, we need somebody that's more persistent, knows how they do. So they hired Miss Jones. And uh, I stayed with Miss Jones, and I think we did radio for like two, three years on, on Hot 97 Morning Show. That was a really great um, morning show. What did you learn from Miss Jones during that period? Because now mm -hmm. people work hard to get to a morning show slot. That, that's not an easy slot to get in radio. Right. You're coming off of the clubs, hard body, mm -hmm. Saturday nights. Right. You're doing whatever you can do behind the scenes, but you're not prime time yet. Morning show on Hot 97, that's a big deal. Right. What'd you learn? I mean, from Ms. Jones, the, the, the main thing, I learned a lot of things not to do with Ms. Jones, not to do in the industry, but I also learned the main thing with Ms. Jones, what made Ms. Jones probably one of the best personalities mm -hmm. ever, she got in her own way, but ever, was that she can pull anything out of the sky, make it a topic, and make it great radio. So we could be talking about, um, let's say, 
this young lady's writing right now, right? She could make it a topic. Call us up right now, 800-585-1051. Do y'all think her pen is blue or black? Let's talk about it. The winner gets so-and-so. <laughs> and everybody would call the phone lines. She was brilliant at that. She, she wouldn't come prepared, but she didn't need to because her mind was that great. And I was like, wow. So even now, I can be listening, driving on my way to, you know, to work, and I could just think of something just off of that because she taught me how to think like that. Wow. You go from the morning show, and then you made a really nice power move, and you start doing Newer 2. I started like, doing a Newer 2, yeah. What's Newer 2? Um, Newer 2 was a show where it was basically exclusives on air. Mm -hmm. And I would pretty much just break new music on the radio. And it was a show that took off in New York, and everybody loved it. And it was creating a lot of steam. People were mad that I was playing their records before they came out. And it created a lot of steam. Did you catch a lot of beef for that? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. But I, I didn't care. I mean, it was about doing what I had to do to stay relevant, and we did it. So for anybody who is watching who wants to be a DJ, and there's so many facets of yourself because you are, you know, you're way more than a DJ, um, would you recommend they play whatever they can play to get heard? Like, what, what's your recommendation to anybody watching who wants to be a DJ? They want to cut through because there's so many DJs out there now. Back when you started DJing, right. you know, there were crates, there, were, there was wax. Mm -hmm. It wasn't as easy to become a DJ. How does somebody cut through now? I mean, now it's, it's, a, it's a lot more difficult because of this thing called Serato and a laptop. Anybody could be a DJ now, you know? Um, there's no more record. You don't have to blend. I mean, the machines pretty much do it for you. Mm -hmm. And now it's just making yourself different from what everybody's doing being that outside person, whether it's doing the clubs, whether it's doing a radio show, a podcast to get your name out there. Those are the things you need to do then. I mean, before, I mean, I'm, I would pay studio rats. Like, I would pay the guys in the studio that mix the records. Most of the times, artists disrespect them. You guys at the labels weren't paying them much money. Mm -hmm. So I give somebody $100, yo, next time Biggie record a record, make sure I get that. <laughs> yeah, I got a Biggie record. Yo, next time, I got a Method Man record. Here, I got a Nas record. So while we're going crazy, the artist's going crazy trying to figure out where these leaks coming from. They came from the studio. Straight from the studio. Straight from the studio. Wow. Because if you think about it, I mean, when y'all leave the studio, who's in there mixing the record? He's not getting paid. Not getting paid. Y'all gave him $5 an hour. Now here I come, here's $100. You don't think he's not going to give me the record? You did something that is... Um, at the time, nobody ever dared do. Hot 97 was, that was hip hop's radio station. I don't care if you Correct. lived in Oregon, mm -hmm. you know, you know Hot 97. It's a new station in town. Power 105. And DJ MV decides to jump ship. Sinking ship. <laughs> MV, that's not an easy decision. It couldn't have been at that time. It was. Was it? Yeah. How'd that, how'd that deal come to, into play? I'll tell you exactly what it was. So it was the newer two. Mm -hmm. And um, at the time, it was uh, Cypher Sounds and Rosenberg in the morning. Mm -hmm. Big Dennis in middays. Shout out to Big Dennis. Uh, afternoons was, uh, who was doing afternoons at the time? I don't remember who was doing afternoons at the time. Maybe Sonny? Yep, no, after Angie Martinez came back. It was Angie Martinez. And then after Angie Martinez, it was Flex. So my contract was about to be up, and yeah, this is going to sound crazy, but I wanted middays, right? No this is shout to Big Dennis. I love Big Dennis, but I felt like at that time, I was on fire, and I wanted that. And I told him, I said, yo, the stations across the street is offering me all this money. They want to give me this slot in middays, but I'm riding with the team. And it was like, we're not going to give it to you. We're not going to pay you more money. So I was like, all right, I'm going to leave. I'm thinking if I say I'm going to leave, they're going to be like, no, MV, don't leave. We want you. So they was like, ah, well, there's nothing I can do. I was like, all right. So I packed all my stuff, and I'm like, I'm leaving. I'm out. And then when I got downstairs, I seen the phone ring. I was like, all right, hey. <laughs> I'm like, what's up, Ebro? He was like, yo, you really out? And I'm like, yeah. He was like, no, you really, really out? I'm like, yeah, I'm going. He was like, damn, he was like, I can't do nothing. We don't have a budget, this, that, and the other. I was like, all right, 
I hung up the phone. I walked over to Power 1051 and I'm like, I was like, I called my wife, I'm like, babe, I don't know what's gonna happen. I said, but you know, we gonna, I'm gonna go over there and ball out. Like, I, I'm a, I said, I'm gonna try to fucking kick the stations back and do what I gotta do. They offered me afternoons, and I went in the afternoons and I started balling. I was like, I'm, I'm just going at everybody. And I started just picking up the morale in the company. You know, Self was there, Pro Style came, and Pro Style was doing middays, Clue was doing nights. Um, at the time, Ed Lover and Dre was doing, Ed Lover was doing mornings. And I was like, yo, let's just run. Like, we the hottest in the streets. Let's push it. Let's, let's play. And we just started playing. And one day they came up to me and was like, yo, you know, we love what you're doing. You've got the station running. Everybody's excited. You guys are running as a team. That's what they didn't have. They didn't have camaraderie. They, nobody was running with each other. Mm -hmm. Everybody did their own things. And it got to the point, I'm like, nah, we all fuck with each other. This is the station. Clue do a party. We all do a party. Self do a party. We all do a party. And we started doing that. And it was bigger because now we all running together. And they called me and it was like, you know, we need a morning show. And I was like, I ain't doing mornings no more, bro. I was like, I'm not waking up at 4 o'clock in the morning. This, that, and the other. They was like, well, what about if we double your salary? I'm like, bro, I'm not doing mornings. They was like, what about if we triple your salary? I'm like, when do we start? <laughs> and I was like, well, who, who are we working with? They was like, Charlemagne. I'm like, nah. <laughs> I'm like, nah. They was like, why not? I'm like, he got fired four times, bro. I'm like, I got, at the time I had two kids. I'm like, I got two kids. I'm like, I'm not fucking with him. They was like, nah, I talk to him, speak to him. So, you know, I spoke to Charlemagne. He was like, nah, let's go. I'm ready. It's Danny Ave. I'm like, all right, bet. I'm like, who else? They're like, Angela Yee. I'm like, nah. They're like, why not? I'm like, she does serious satellite radio. She curses like a sailor. One curse word, it's over. No. They was like, nah, she good. So it's like, all right. So they, they kind of put us all in the room. And what made that show work, The Breakfast Club work, was we were all, I always say we were all side pieces. I was Miss Jones' side piece. Mm -hmm. Charlemagne was Wendy Williams' side piece. Angela Yee was Cypher Sound's side piece. So we all never chased the stardom. We all never say, oh, this is my shit, my shit. It was never like that. We all knew how to share because we all worked with main people. So that's what made the show great. So when we first started the show, I was the, the, the marquee because I was the biggest person at the time. But for myself, it didn't really matter. I figured we'd all have a time when we would shine. I shined at first, then ye shine. Now Charlemagne shining. Like we all take our chance with shining. And it's just a matter of not letting it get to our heads. Because it's like, I tell everybody it's like this. It's like I'm the point guard and I want to win the game. Right? I'm going to give it to the, to, to the dude that's going to help us win. If it's Charlemagne, I'll you. If it's ye, throw it to the three point line. Because at the end of the day, we want to win. Doesn't matter who's the biggest, doesn't matter who's getting the virals and say, it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, it's winning. And, you know, I think that we've been the, the biggest morning show ever in Urban, which I didn't even, wasn't anything that was ever planned. We just took it one day at a time. But the fact that it's happening, that we've evolved to so many different things, is just, that's how it came about. It, it was no, like, we, didn't, we couldn't even think of a name. It was like, first we had a big three, <laughs> then we was Illuminati in the morning. Like, we came up with all these stupid names. Where'd the breakfast come, co club come from? Somebody just suggested it and was like, yo, that's dope because we can invite people in to our club. Like it's, it's not one of those things, it's like, this is our show, this is kind of like everybody's show, mm -hmm. where everybody can call in and say what they want to say, and that's how the show came together. Wow, you, you touched on something that I think is so important, and, and it's really checking your ego, because at the time that The Breakfast Club started, DJ, DJ Envy is the biggest name on the marquee. Correct. By far. People knew Charlemagne, mm -hmm. people knew Ye. But they weren't household names at right. that point. Mm -hmm. um, for you, was it that simple? Yeah. For you to just say, you know what, I'm trying to win yeah. by any means necessary? It was, it was two things that, that was that simple. One, I, wa I wanted to win. Mm -hmm. And two, I always thought if it didn't work, it never really effed up my name. If it was DJ Envy, Envy's morning show and it, and it was bricked out, I couldn't go back to, to middays. I couldn't go back to the nights because my, my name would be shit. Mm -hmm. But now if it's all of us, I could be like, damn, that shit suck. But let me go back here and go do this. So that's how I kind of looked at it too. But I just knew with all our work ethic and what we were capable of doing, we couldn't be stopped. I mean, you had three people at the time that, like, we ran ball. Like, we were out every night at the club. We were doing everything where we could touch the people 
and we were all there all the time together. We couldn't be stopped. And I, I, and I knew what it was. I knew there was no team around that could do what we could do. And we all had something to prove. I think um, it's a couple of things I want to touch on. Number one, you keep going back to you guys were out. You're out, you're moving, you're doing this. What does a typical day for DJ Envy look like? Right now? Not right now. I want to go back a little bit mm -hmm. because I know you're not doing clubs as much as you once did. In New York. In New York. At the t at Breakfast Club is taking off. Mm -hmm. I got to believe at that time, if Breakfast Club is not your main source of income, it's your second um, second in, in, in line in terms of the amount of money you're bringing in to clubs. Mm -hmm. So you got to be in the clubs. Right. Clubs, you're leaving there at 2, 3 in the morning. Yes. What did a typical day look like for you? So at that time, it's funny, actually, the, the Breakfast Club was the third income. So we do the Breakfast Club 4 a.m. to 12 noon. Right? At 12 noon, I would leave the Breakfast Club and I worked for Virgin Records. Yep. I worked for, with So So Deaf, Jermaine Dupri. Um, and from there, I did that till about 5, 6 o'clock. 5, 6 o'clock, I'd go home, take a shower, kiss my wife, kiss the kids. Nine, I would take a nap, and then 9, 10 o'clock, I'm back in the clubs. And I did a club, I would say, five nights, six nights a week, um, to the point where I had a bedroom at the station. And I would sleep at that bedroom in the station, wake up five, ten minutes before air, get up, and then do it all over again. And that's what I did to make sure that my name and our name was everywhere. I did every club from the hood to the ratchet to the strips to the, the crossover clubs, the pop. I did everything. I wanted to be there, and I wanted to make sure people see me. Where did that motivation come from? Because you're talking, everybody talks. I don't sleep, mm -hmm. sleep's the cousin of death. Mm -hmm. You're living it. Right. And, and, you know, even myself, knowing you for years, we all look from the outside in. I know you have to be up at least at 4 a.m. Right. To be at that station at 5. Right. But I also know you, unlike ye, unlike Charlemagne, you, you, you spin. Right. And you're doing two, three clubs a night at that time. Right. You know, strip clubs were, were heavy and you're going boom, boom, boom. That's a lot of wear and tear on your body. Yeah. And it's a lot of sacrifice on your family. And we'll right. get to that. Mm -hmm. But how long did you keep up that pace? I did it for years. I did it for like maybe five, six years. Really? I did it for five, six years. Um, and I was the first DJ to start doing two, three clubs a night. And the reason being is the clubs wouldn't pay that much in New York. So my way of thinking was I'll get a bag in New Jersey because New Jersey clubs close early. Then after New Jersey, I go get a regular club in the city and then I end off in a strip club. So we were triple booking. And I started that. Like mm -hmm. that was my thing. My manager, June, who, who I'm still with, was like, nah, we got a triple book. And I remember Mr. C coming up to me and was like, you do how many parties a <laughs> night? And I'm like, yeah. And that was funny to see all the DJs doing so many parties a night, but I started that because that's how I got the bags. And I would just do that. And I was telling somebody outside, when you enjoy what you do, it's not work. It's like, I really enjoy it. I really have the love for it. I love going out there and seeing people dance and seeing people move. I love going out there and talking to people and discussing it. That's my motivation. So it's like, when you, when you love something, it's, it's not work. So it's not work. In terms of the Breakfast Club, mm -hmm. when did you know we got a hit? Because you're fighting for years for this. Right. You come up old school, through the streets, mm -hmm. mixtapes, you're in the clubs, you're on radio, um, one night a week, two nights a week. You, get, you go do a morning show, but you're in the back. Go across the street, now you got this Breakfast Club thing. At what point did you know I'm on the Chicago Bulls? Like, mm -hmm. like this is, I'm on a dynasty right now. This is real. There, there was, well, the one thing about the Breakfast Club that was different from on the other side of the street is we all had relationships. So it was like, an artist, if they had to pick one, they're going to pick who they know. They knew me. They knew ye. They knew Charlemagne. So it was easy to get. And the, and the way that I knew was, was, I always tell everybody, that infamous Ray J interview. When Ray J called from Vegas and said he socked fabulous and he had an indoor pool, outdoor pool, five Rolls Royces. And I tell everybody before that, 
before that Ray J interview, I think they were going to turn Power 105 to country music. Like, the ratings were bad. You know, program director wasn't looking in, in, you know, at, in us in the window anymore. <laughs> and I just felt it. And when that happened, it went viral. And when it went viral, I remember uh, Doc Winner, which is the guy that oversees all urban at iHeart, said, nah, we can't let this go. They got something. Let's give it a little more. And from there, it took off. And we really didn't have any money for marketing. So it's funny, I'm driving in now and I see all these campaigns with the Breakfast Club on it. We never had that. We used our own connections and resources. We were cool with Worldstar. We were cool with the blogs. So we always used the blogs to put clips out. Cool, you know, cool with media takeout, put clips up. And it, they kind of just did the promotion for us. And then after that, every artist wanted to come on the show because they knew that not only did they got a radio interview, they got that promotion. And the rest was history. Who's your favorite guest so far? Oh, man. So many, so many. I, I think one of my favorite guests, uh, I think was Farrakhan. Okay. I think Farrakhan was one of my favorites. And the reason that I, I think he was one of my favorite guests was because I didn't like him before. Just raised not to, to like him. He's a hateful person and this, that, and the other. And then when he came on the show, he, he really enlightened me and, and enlightened my community and, and what he thought our community should be. And it was really one of them eye-opening things like, damn. You know, I, to the day, I wasn't even going to do the interview. I was like, nah, I ain't going to do this one. And my wife was like, nah, I think you should do it. Like, have that interview with him. I, I, every question that you have, talk to him and ask him. So I think that was one of the, my best, my favorite interviews. Who's your least favorite interview? My least favorite? I think has to be probably uh, Chief Keith. Why is that? I think because... We pulled Chief Keith pretty much out of the Chicago streets and just put him on radio. And that was just a bad idea. You know, he just got signed, they put him on, and he didn't know how to do an interview. Mm -hmm. So he'd be like, yo, what's up, bro? Chief Keith, you got a new project? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, he really thought he was being interrogated, and he was acting like it, like, so, what you doing tomorrow? Nothing. Like, it was like that. <laughs> but it was his first interview ever. I don't even think we ever put it out. But, um, I mean, it was, it was a learning experience for us, and then I'm sure for him, because this was the first time, but I think that was probably my least favorite. You're a very aspirational guy. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody knows you for the cars. Mm -hmm. You really do live this rapper lifestyle. Jewelry. Um, do you think, in just moving this interview on, that you have a responsibility, you, to the people who follow you, to the people who follow The Breakfast Club? Or do you feel this image that you're putting out is an aspirational image mm -hmm. for them to live up to? Um, I put it to you like this, right? I honestly don't give part of my French a fuck what people think. The reason I do what I do is to show kids and to show people that you ain't got to be a drug dealer. You ain't got to be a rapper. You ain't got to play basketball. You ain't got to be a scammer. You ain't got to do none of that, because I'm not. I don't play basketball. I don't sell drugs. I'm not a scammer. I'm just a hardworking person. And because I work hard, if I want to show something that I really purchased and that I paid taxes for and somebody has a problem with them, I don't care. Because what I'm trying to catch is that kid that's just like, damn, I want to be like that. You know what I mean? If I could open his eyes and say, damn, mom, what's real estate? That's all I want. Mom, uh, what's Hampton University? What school? I want to go to school for that because if Clue wasn't there for me, who knows what I would have done. So if I could be those for, the, for those kids, that's what I want. Now, I understand if I was scamming and doing something illegal and doing something disrespectful, then there's something different. But I do my stuff the right way. You know what I mean? Got a question for you. It's a random question, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. Um, we know the money's real now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what do you think about the whole concept of fake it till you make it? Because we come from an in industry, both you and I. I've, if I've seen it once, I've seen it a million times. People are wearing their entire life mm -hmm. on their wrist, mm -hmm. around their neck, shoes, the car. 
that concept because this new generation, everybody wants to be their own boss, mm -hmm. everybody feels that they're an entrepreneur, and everybody feels, I need to fake it till I make it, until the money start coming in. What's your thoughts on that? I mean, I think there's, there's two ways. I mean, faking it till you make it can work. I'm not gonna sit here and lie and say, you know, if you come to the club and you got jewelry on and you look like you're a million bucks, what are they gonna do? They're gonna let you in because they're gonna think that you are. But to fake it till you make it and not have a plan doesn't work. There's certain things you can't do. You can't fake it till you make it and then have to pull up in the projects and could possibly get robbed, shot, stabbed, or killed. You gotta be smart with what you do. There's so many people that come up to me that own expensive cars and expensive jewelry and expensive jeans and, they, and they've been renting for the last 10 years. That's a problem. Now your priorities are messed up, you know? Um, so in certain aspect it does work. In a certain aspect I think people are, are, are stupid for doing it. You know, you gotta smarten up. You gotta do what's better. You gotta do better. You can't, your mom can't be living in the projects and you got a, a, a Bentley. You know, you, you gotta, there's certain things that you have to do. I, I, I think you just gave the best answer anybody could give. Faking it to make, faking it till you make it without a plan, that's really the problem. Correct. You have to have a plan. Who inspires you? Now? Now. Um, it depends. Different people inspire me. Um, Swiss Beats inspires the shit out of me. Why? He just does amazing things, man. Whether it's his investments, whether his, his home, whether it's his, just what he does, he really inspires me when it comes to that aspect. Um, my partner, Caesar, that I do real estate with, he inspires me. Uh, just the way he does his real estate and he buys the real estate and, and he goes hard in what he does. Um, my son, my son Logan inspires me. Um, and, and he inspires me because not for nothing, the kid has everything. Mm -hmm. He doesn't care about it all. He don't care about sneakers. He doesn't care about clothes, jewelry, none of that. He doesn't care. But he plays football. He's one of the stars on his team. The boy works out every day. He's working out. He's in the gym downstairs working out. Um, that, that motivation, that inspiration to see him, it's like he has a love for something and he'll do whatever it takes to, to do it. You know, he's not the biggest on the team. He's not the strongest on the team, but he has the biggest heart. He'll run through a whole crowd of people because that's how he feels. And that's the inspiration. That's, that's, when I look at him, I'm like, he inspires me to push myself harder. Wow. Can we segue to your family? For sure. Them? Absolutely. You're, 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 and again, you were pushing family mm -hmm. when it wasn't cool. Correct. Especially in our business. It, right. was, it was better to say, I'm a bachelor. Mm -hmm. You always push the fact, mm -hmm. I love my wife. Mm -hmm. You now have five kids. Five, yep. Where, you know, and I asked this question of several of our guests. Where's the work-life balance for you? How do you juggle that? I mean, it's easy for me now, but back then, I mean, the industry raised me. The industry raised me that you had to be a bachelor, you had to be single, you had to live that lifestyle, and that's the lifestyle I lived until I almost lost my wife. And then you had to take a step back and be like, well, what's love? Like, what is money? What is wealthy? What is being successful? And I realized I didn't want to lose that over this industry. I didn't want to lose that over anything else. So I had to kind of find myself and really learn what love was, what love is, and get a, a relationship with God. And it's funny to say that because everybody said, yeah, I got a relationship with God. God is good. God is great. Thank you for the food we eat. Amen. Mm -hmm. And that's what my relationship was. I go to church maybe on Easter whenever my grandmother made me, but then... When you get to a dark area and you feel like, damn, I'm about to lose it all. This money means nothing. These cars, this jewelry means nothing. And then you realize that I met my wife when she was 15, I was 16. We've been married 18 years together, 25, my high school sweetheart. Um, and you realize what love is. And then you try to fix all the wrongs that you've ever done. And you realize what's the most important thing out of everything. And that's my wife and my kids. And I was like, I'm going to promote that. I don't care what people say. But I, I realized with me promoting it and me pushing it so hard, I start to see other people doing it. And that feels good. You know, that, that shows me that I'm, I'm a positive influence on certain things. And, and I just love to see people promoting their wives and their kids. And I love to see people playing with their kids online and doing stupid dances. I mean, I love to see the most gangsterous rapper 
being pooky 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 with your kids because that's what it's about. Mm -hmm. And you know, and that's what I'm about. I don't I, like. I will embarrass myself with my kids. I don't care. Whatever's gonna put a smile on my daughter's face or my son's face, it doesn't matter. None of that else matters. So you go through, a, and and I speak about this. I wouldn't typically do it, but you've been very open yeah, about yeah. Um, the struggles in your marriage. Mm -hmm. Almost losing your wife. Correct. That really opened your eyes to damn. Mm -hmm. I have so much that is beyond music, is beyond money. Mm -hmm. This is what's important in my life. Absolutely. How did that transition to your Casey Crew podcast? Well, after me trying to, after I had my infidelity and um, my shit was big, I apologized on radio, took all my ego out of me. I didn't care about ego, I just care about fixing the situation, which took, it took, a, it took a long time. And, and we still work as a, as a, as a couple, a married couple. Look, looking back, and I'm sorry to cut you off your train of thinking, but apologizing on radio, I know at the time that could have seemed like a good idea, but shouldn't some things be left quiet? Nah. Really? Because I took it like I embarrassed her in public, so why not apologize in public? I can embarrass her in public and then be behind the scenes, baby, 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 I'm sorry, but I wanted the world to know, yo, I fucked up and I'm sorry. And whatever it takes and however long it's going to take, I'm willing to put the work in to make sure you understand that I'm sorry, and I want a second chance to make this right. And okay, I know that's, that's your train of thinking, mm -hmm. but what was hers when you went on morning radio and apologized for infidelity? Um, it was a little bit of both. She was she was upset. She was embarrassed. Um, she couldn't believe I did it. But see, one thing I would say about my wife is she's that type of person where. She could be mad at me, but then when the world starts to try to make fun of me for something, she's like, nah, that's, that's still my baby. Um, and that's what it was. And um, we worked. We worked, like I worked like hell to, to, to make sure that we were good. I never left the house. Like, I'm like, I'm not leaving this house. Once I leave the house, it's over. I'm not, whatever I got, whatever I got to take. If I got to sleep in the garage, in the car, and um, I worked like crazy. You know what I mean? And, and it took a lot of working. It took a lot of help from people. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I always tell a story about Tyrese, who I didn't really know at the time. He just heard me apologize and was like, yo, bro, I, I feel your pain. I want to help. And, you know, Tyrese was calling my wife. And it was, it, was, it was crazy and weird, but all these people helped. You know what I mean? And we got to a position where we could talk. And then, you know, we just were working on our relationship. And after, you know, she decided to forgive me, and we just started working on our relationship just as being open. Uh, I think in a relationship, I just wasn't open as a person. You know, I wasn't honest as a person, you know what I mean? And the cheating actually helped because after we got through that, it kind of left our relationship raw where everything was there. I can talk to my wife about anything. She can talk to me about anything. We can discuss anything in this world. And when we started moving on and started talking, so many people would come up to us and be like, yo, I, I admire y'all. I admire what y'all doing and how y'all did it, how? So we said, let's do a podcast and talk about our relationship. And the podcast became more than just a podcast. It became therapy for us because we're talking about shit that's uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. We're talking about real shit. We don't keep nothing hidden, nothing at all. Um, and we just started doing it. And people would just started coming out and listening and coming to, you know, our when we do live events and stuff like that, and it just kind of caught on, and we just said, you know, we're going to keep doing it. So it is therapeutic for both of you guys. I think so, yeah. You guys go into detail. Everything, yeah. In your podcast. Yeah. How does that work with your children? They, 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 they got to listen to this. They embarrass sometimes. <laughs> they embarrass sometimes. But my kids, I mean, I got a crazy relationship with my kids, man. And I tell everybody it's, it's the best thing. Like, my daughter's 18, and she's going to NYU next year. And... It's weird, man. It's weird. And the reason I say it's weird is like, I can go, I could go in my daughter's bed and we could cuddle and talk all night about everything that's going on in the world. It's the weirdest shit. But then I could go in my son's bedroom and me and him could lay down and watch TV all night and talk all night. I didn't have that relationship with my mom and dad. So for, for me, it's like, it's the craziest thing because I've never had a son or, I mean, I, I mean of course not, but my daughter can come up to me and talk to me, dad, this guy tried to kick it to me and said this. What should I say back? And it's, and it's the weirdest thing. Or my son, I'm telling him, I'm giving my son advice how to talk to a girl and how to be manly and this, that, and the other. And it's like, 
they're more than just my kids, they're my friends. Like, my kids are like my friends. And it's dope because it's not like, you know, people say, oh, I'm not your, I'm not your friend, I'm your father. And my house is not that, it's I'm your friend and your father. Mm -hmm. You can talk to me about everything. When it, when it is, and it's the, it's the best relationship ever, like, it's, it's the best relationship ever. Do you ever think you spoil your kids too much? Because mm -hmm. you come from two blue collar, working, working class um, parents. Mm -hmm. You're giving your kids exposure yeah. to everything. Correct. We all want to be better than our parents were. Correct. We want to give our kids everything. Right. In some weird way, do you think you're hindering them? Uh, I don't think I'm hindering them. I do spoil them. I do. I spoil the shit out of them. As I should. I spoil myself. I spoil my wife. As long as they're doing what's right and they're doing what they need to do, yes, I'm going to spoil them. Like, like I tell you, my son, he doesn't care about... It's funny, my son just became my shoe size. <laughs> Before that, he didn't care. And I tell him, like, yo, I, and I, I'm going to sneak ahead. I'm like, yo, go downstairs. You can wear whatever sneaker you want. He doesn't care. He don't ask for nothing. You know, that's just him. My daughter, she's a little different. But that's daddy's little girl. But whatever, like, whatever they want, they can have. You know what I mean? And I look at my kids, and I look at my life, mm -hmm. right? And I look at what I did at 16 and 17. You know, not to put my daughter's business out there, but she's 18 and never kissed a boy before in her life. Somebody stuck their teeth? <laughs> ben, yeah. this is my assistant and one of my daughter's best friends, right? Has she? She doesn't even know how to kiss, but she's that innocent. I'm not saying she doesn't want to, but it's just what it is. You, you know do what I mean? realize people are going to be watching this. Right? She knows, I mean, she knows. We talk about Some it on the podcast. Some guy at NYU is going to be like, I'm waiting on her. <laughs> Next year might be different, but, <laughs> but right, you know, it's, it, it is what it is, you know. But it's one of those things I also feel because it's like, and this is some things that I don't like. I feel like because I live in an affluent area and she goes to school with mostly white kids, they don't respect her like they would respect her if she lived in Queens. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because why? You know, the white boys kick it to the white girls. She doesn't feel that necessarily love. And that's the thing that I, I, I want her to have. That's why I really wanted her to go to HBCU. I wanted her to be around her people and really experience everything, you know? She doesn't have that. When we go to my son's basketball games, all the kids, yo, yo, yo. And, and it's so funny because, you know, um, I took her to Miami one time. We all went to Miami. And, and that's one thing. Like, when I do shows, I take my whole family. That's, that's, if I'm DJing in Miami, we all going to Miami. We all, you know, that's how I am. So she, uh, she goes to the beach with her friend and she runs, dad, dad, a guy touched me. So I jump up, I grab a rock. I'm like, who, who, what happened? I'm running, I'm looking. I'm like, what happened? She's like, a guy touched my arm. It's like, hey, beautiful. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, you know how many arms I touched back in the day? <laughs> how many arms my friends did? But she just didn't get it. She's so innocent that she doesn't even know that that's that was a guy trying to say hello and trying to kick it to her wow but she just didn't get it because she's never felt that before you know but i love it at least you're not as crazy as ti nah going in. <laughs> I, I i don't i don't have to like my daughter really tells me everything you like she, like it's the weirdest relationship like some dude hit her and was like uh <laughs> some dude hit her on she, she put a, a picture of herself on snapchat and she was smiling and a dude was like, yo, uh, I wish I could just see you later with nothing but that smile on, right? Yeah, a little G. I, that's some G I do have, I do have mom. <laughs> right? But, you know, so I reply for her. I'm like, yeah, why don't you come to my house? And my father said he'll punch you in your eye. <laughs> but that's just, you know, but that's the kind of relationship we have. She will tell me that, you know? Nice. Mm -hmm. Let's talk business for a second. Yes, sir. You're so much more than a DJ. Um, you are truly a mogul in the making. When I think of you, you're up there with the Khalids of the world because DJing is just a small part of your resume at this point. Correct. Everyone knows you for the extravagant cars. Mm -hmm. How did the car show come into play for you? And are they profitable? Um... I love the car shows. Um, when I was a kid, my whole thing is I always, I love cars. You know, I just love cars. I used to love them, love them. And I said, one day when I get it, I'm going to do a car show. 
So I would go to all the car shows. Flex's car show, the Jacob Javis car shows, whatever car show I can go. And I was like, you know what? What I'm going to do is when I do a car show, I'm going to take everything out of their car show that I loved and keep, and everything that I didn't love, I'm going to get rid of. So I said, I'm going to do a car show. And out of all those car shows, I said, you know what? I want to make it about family. Those car shows are not about family. They make their cars, you know, some car shows about the artists, some car shows about corporate. I said, I don't want, I don't want to have an artist perform because then I'm going to bring the wrong element in. I'm going to bring an element that just wants to see a, a rapper perform. I don't want that. I'm going to bring a family car show where you could bring your kids. We have jumpies. We have video games. We have face painters. You could bring your wife. We have, uh, they'll do facials. Sephora does facials. Uh, there's a woman doing hair braiding. I'm going to do educational. I'm going to bring health and wealth over here. I'm going to bring a mortgage row, a uh, real estate row where people do uh, real estate. They do credit repair, lending, and all that on this side. And then there's nothing but cars where you can see celebrity cars. You can see exclusive cars, old cars, and everything in one building. And then, as a cherry on the top, when you just come to the show and you're just looking at cars and chilling, all of a sudden you look on stage and be like, is that 50 Cent? Oh, shit, 50 Cent's performing. Kind of like a cherry on top. And we did it the first year, and we had about, I only want, the first year I did it, I said, I only want 1,000 people. I said, because I, I, I don't know how it's going to be. Let me get 1,000 people and figure out what I'm doing. First year, we got 3,000. Second year, I'm like, all right, let's do 5,000. Second year, we did 8,000. So this year, we're doing four car shows, uh, one in Detroit, one in Houston, one in Atlanta, and in New York. And in New York, when it's so big, we got to do two days. So we're doing a two-day car show. And is it profitable? Yes. Absolutely. That's the reason I do them. Um, so what I try to do is anything that I love and I enjoy, I try to make sure it pays for itself. So for myself, my addiction of cars and how I love cars pays for my car shows do it. So if you think about it, if you just do simple math and say 80,000, 8,000 people at $20 each with sponsors, you can figure out exactly. that it's uh, profitable. I remember, and this is years ago, this is going back oh, to... Oh, and it's my business. I own it 100% completely. The there, is no, there is no promoter. There is no second person to pay. There is no this. We book the venues. We handle security. We do it with sponsors. The New York one, we do it with Lincoln Tech, everything. To even show you, watch this. Benz is my assistant. How much is the venue in Atlanta? $13. And how, how big is it? That's my assistant. We book everything. I know the prices. I know security. Benz, can we have food or drinks in that venue? Union. Union building. That means the union has to pay for everything. How do I know that? Because it's all me. There is no promoter. We own it. We own that business. But go ahead. So what's your vision with this? Are you taking it on the road now? Is, yeah, is the vision to build it, to sell it? Like, wh where's your vision? Because you don't do anything without a plan. Uh, the vision is to build it and to sell it. Um, that's what we want to do. Um, we're, we're taking it on the road. We're taking it to all these different cities. And How many cities this year, 2020? This year we're doing four, and okay. next year we're doing, a, in 2021, we're doing eight. Uh, and, and that's the business, to, you know, to, to make it as big as possible and sell it, you know? But it's fun. I love cars. Like, I love purchasing cars. I love finding cars, old cars, new cars. I drive. People are like, why do you drive? Because that is my release. Some people, they got to smoke weed. Some people are into drinking. Some people are into gambling. Some people, TV. My love is driving that car. The best thing that ever happened to me is working in the morning. You know why? Because at 4 o'clock in the morning when I'm driving to work, the roads are empty. My kids and wife are sleeping. There's no business. My assistant is sleeping. There's nothing to do but drive and enjoy life. That's my best time. That's my relaxation. You know, I know you and Flex have butted head over the years. Mm -hmm. You guys are more alike than you're different. You do realize that, correct? Um, I wouldn't say in that. In so many ways. I wouldn't say that. <laughs> you are. I definitely wouldn't say that. I'm, I'm talking work ethic. I'm talking work ethic. Mm -hmm. I'm talking love of cars. Mm -hmm. I'm talking building businesses from scratch. Mm -hmm. You guys are very similar. I wouldn't say that. Okay. Fair enough. And the reason I wouldn't say that is, is we have two different ways of doing, doing things. Um, he does it one way, I do it another way. I like bringing people together. 
I want to see other people win, and I try to help people win. I also do a lot of giving back to the community. No matter what I do, whether it was giving Rutgers money, $25,000 for their foundation, or every car show that I do, I give a percentage back to the schools. Every car show I make, I make sure I cut a check to a school. I make sure that I find uh, kids in orphanages or group homes to make sure that they can get in there for free. I do that because I try to give back to my community. Yeah, I do the turkey drives, the toys for tots, I do the real estate classes in different communities for free for people to learn. I'm into giving back. Until I see that from him, then you can say we're alike. But until that, you can't say I'm like that man. Respect that. Respect that. Okay. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. But I do believe he does give back. But be it as it may, you talked about your seminars. Mm -hmm. And you talked about giving back. Mm -hmm. Another business. How did you come into the real estate seminars? And before we even go there, you're not going to remember this, but I remember many years ago. I don't even know what artists I brought up. You were on Jonesy in the Morning at that time. And we're, uh -huh. both you and I are kind of like this. And we're just talking while the artists and Jones are talking, right? And you said, Prez, I'm moving. And I remember you had just bought your house. And you were like, I didn't even change a light light bulb, and I made something, and I don't remember the number, but it was some astronomical number. You was like, I made something like $70,000 mm -hmm. on this house. Is that where you got the real estate bars? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I didn't understand. Can you tell anybody who wasn't there that story? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I didn't understand it. So I got my first check uh, by falling off a motorcycle, right? Riding, I bought a motorcycle, and um, I was going to sell it. So I cleaned up the bike, and I was going to the buyer's house, and I was riding in the slow lane. I used to ride, and I was a wild boy on a bike. I wheelie, flying, it didn't matter. That day, I was riding nice and slow, because I was like, I don't want no bugs on this bike, I'm gonna sell it, so I'm riding in the slow lane. <laughs> Lady loses control, hits me, I fly over, the, over her car. So now I remember this day. Now, I'll remind you, it was cold that day. It was like September 1st, it was cold. And the only reason I remember was September 1st was around my birthday, my birthday is September 3rd. So now I'm sliding, I had a jacket on, I never wore a jacket, I had a jacket on, and I'm sliding down the highway. And I remember just holding my head up like this because I was like, I don't want to get decapitated, right? So I'm sliding, zzz, zzz, and then when I stop, I dive in the bushes. And, you know, the doctor's like, well, so uh, one of the cars pulls over. He's a doctor. He's like, why, why, why are you diving in the bushes? I'm like, because I thought cars were going to come, so I just dove out the way. So um, I had just bought a bracelet, a diamond bracelet, and it was in the middle of the highway. And he was like, what are you doing? I was like, that's my bracelet. He was like, sit down. I was like, you going to get my bracelet? He was like, yeah, so he went and got it. So I'm, I'm getting up, I'm checking myself. I'm like, oh shit, no broken bones. So he was like, what's wrong with you? I'm like, nothing. He was like, sit your, nah, it's a white doctor. He's talking to me crazy, crazy. <laughs> He's like, sit your ass down and call an ambulance. My like, fucking gosh. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm like, all right, man. I'm like, he says he's talking to me so hard. I'm like, all right. So I call an ambulance, ambulance comes, picks me up, takes me to the hospital. I had like a little bump on my knee. So um, I was like, I think my mother was like, yeah, you can sue. I was like, all right, I'm going to sue. So I'm from the hood. I called Jacoby and Maya, right? <laughs> so Jacoby and Maya is like, yeah, you got to go to rehab. You got to do this four days a week. You got to stay off your leg. I'm like, I'm DJ, and I ain't stayed on my, my leg. It's like, well, if you want to do it, that's what you have to do. I'm like, I'm not doing that. So I called the insurance company. I'm like, look, I'm not going to sue you guys. Just pay for my bike, pay for my ambulance. That's it. They was like, yeah, yeah. They was like, come now. I said, all right. Dad, come on, come with me. He's like, all right, we go. I said, how much was the bike? I think the bike was like $7,000. He was like, all right, how much was the hospital bills? I was like, I don't know, like $1,000, $1,200 for the ambulance and seeing the doctor. So like $8,000, $8, $9,000 in full. I was like, all right, give me a check. I was like, all right, thank you. I opened the check, $75,000. I'm like, ha. <laughs> Oh shit. Now mind you, when you get a settlement check, you ain't gotta pay taxes on it. So I'm like, $75,000? I'm like, oh shit. I'm like, I'm gonna buy a car with rims and they're gonna spin TVs. <laughs> and um, I took that check and I brought it home. My wife was like, yeah, well, we're gonna find a house. I'm like, a house? I want a car. <laughs> and she was like, nah, let's, let's go look for a house. I was like, all right, let's look. 
We couldn't find a house. Everything was too expensive. So we found a house in a place called West Milford, New Jersey. West Milford was about an hour, 40 minutes from the city. Wow. Uh, it's so, I would say, such a woodsy area. That's where they tape like Freddie and Jason. That, <laughs> that's that area. For real, that's where they tape it over there. So I lived there. We bought a house there. I think we paid like 400 for the house, 400000 At the time, you could just put 10% down, so I put 40000 down. It was so bad. I didn't know nothing about houses. I walked in. My dad goes to turn on the AC. He's like, he's like, son, your AC doesn't work. I'm like, nah, it's AC. So I go read the contract. It said AC ready. No AC in it. <laughs> so I didn't know what I was doing. So I was like, fuck. So um, this is the time I was working at, at Jonesy when I, st uh, I started working there at Hot 97. So I would drive, and then every time I would drive home, I'd fall asleep because it'd be, it's dark, no lights. I'd doze off. So I was like, babe, we got to sell this house. So we went to sell a house, and this was like four months later. We bought it for four, sold it for four seventy five. How, how much longer? Like five months later, six months later, wow. sold it for four seventy five. And I was like, I just made seventy five thousand in five <laughs> months. I'm like, oh, this is easy. So we bought another house. About six months later, sold that house, made about one hundred fifty thousand. I said, oh, I'm gonna keep doing this. So I, that, that's when I started getting the real estate bug. I was telling somebody out there, I was like, so what happened was, I was like, all right, I started buying another house, flip it, buy another house. So now I had three houses. I'm like, yes, the market falls. So people wanted the house, but at that time, nobody could get a mortgage. So now I had three houses, and I'm like, oh, oh boy, I'm running out. I'm running out of solutions. I started selling cars, jewelry. I was DJing everything, bar mitzvahs, uh, <laughs> what are they called, quinceaneras, whatever that's called. <laughs> I was DJing quinceaneras. I was, anything I could DJ to get money to pay those mortgages, I did. And I finally got rid of all those houses. And I was like, never again this real estate shit, fuck that. And I was like, I'm just staying DJ. I'm not doing a stock market. I'm not, none of that. And I just started DJing again. And I got on The Breakfast Club, Angela Yee had a boyfriend that lived in Detroit. And she was like, yo, I just went out to Detroit, and Detroit has houses for $15,000. So I was like, yee, what kind of house for $15,000? <laughs> what does this shit look like? She was like, nah, the area's growing. You really need to do it. This, that, and the other. I'm like, all right, I'm going to take a trip to Detroit. I go to Detroit, and I'm looking at this house, and it's a 4,000 square feet house, three floors. It's beat up. And I'm like, $12,500? I'm like, you know what? I'm going to buy this. So I bought a couple of them. And I'm like, I'm just going to sit on them, just cut the grass, pay the taxes. Within a year and a half, that $15,000 house and that $12,000 house went up to worth about three fifty. dollars Wow. three fifty. dollars I'm like, okay. <laughs> so I was like, all right. So the first house, I'm like, you know what, I'm going to start fixing up the houses now. Because I was like, now that's three fifty dollars fixed up. So I was like, I'm going to start fixing up the houses. So I don't know what I'm doing. I'm like, I go to a contractor. Homie was like, yeah, I got you. He started fixing up the house. I started sending the money. I was like, let me go fly and check this house. So I went to look, and um, I go in the master bedroom, and it had tile on the wall. And I'm like, is that bathroom tile? He was like, yeah. I'm like, well, why is tile on the master bedroom, bro? He goes, because that's my style. <laughs> I'm like, nah, B, fuck that. Lock this shit up. So I closed the, closed the house up just any other. And um, I just sat on it. And then we got, uh, for that house, I got offered 200000 I paid 15000 for that house. I put 50000 into it. Got that. The other houses, I didn't put nothing in. And I got about one seventy for one and one eighty for another. So I sold all those houses in Detroit. And then I just started buying a property and just started getting into real estate. Buying three families, four families. And then uh, I met my partner, Caesar, And he taught me the real estate game. Um, and he taught me, showed me what I was doing was, what I was doing was right, but I was doing it wrong. And he was telling me that when investors use their money, they don't really use their money. They use other people's money to buy their properties. And they keep their own money. I was like, what are you talking about? And then he broke it down how to do it. And I was like, oh. And I just been hooked ever since. That, that's why I got these, these J's on there a little dirty, because before I got here, I was walking over heroin needles and looking at <laughs> properties and breaking into cribs like it's like what I enjoy to do so after the breakfast club now I go straight to the office my assistant annoys me about everything that we got to do for a couple hours and I go do real estate then I go home pick up the kids 
play with the kids and then sleep and then back up in the morning. So your days now you're doing, before you were doing straight around the clock. Mm -hmm. What does a real DJ Envy day to day look like? I don't do too many parties in New York now. Uh, reason being is just New York can't afford me. Mm -hmm. It's like for me to leave the house, it has to be worth my while now because yeah. it's taking time away from my kids. And right now my kids are at an age, one's 18, one's 16, one's six, one's five, one's three, that they need daddy around. So for me now, I, you know, I'm, I'm out at 4.30 in the morning, 4 o'clock in the morning. I get to work. I do the breakfast club till about 11, 12. Then I'm in the office till about 5, 6 o'clock. And in the office is either car show planning, the Casey Crew podcast planning, seminar planning, uh, looking at properties, buying properties, um, and all that. And, you know, on the weekend, I do travel. So on the weekends, I'm in a different city every, every week, uh, whether it's like this week I'm in Chicago, next week I'm in... North Carolina, last week I was in Miami, the week before that I was there, and I get to those cities early. You know, if I got a party at night, I might get to the city at 10 o'clock, and then when I'm in those cities, I do nothing but look for houses, and then look to pick up houses in different markets, and that's what we do. How many properties do you own now? I have 132 units and a school right now in New Jersey that we're making 60 units. So we're turning the school into apartments. So every classroom will be either a one-bedroom or two-bedroom apartment. How many apartments are you looking at putting in? It's going to be about school? 60, between 60 and 65. Wow. We're just waiting for the approval of parking because you have to have parking to match all those units. And then once we do that, we'll, we will hopefully we'll, that'll be up by the end of summer. There's somebody watching this that's aspiring to get into real estate. Mm -hmm. Have you lost a ton of money in real uh, estate? No. 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 Mm -mm. Even when the market crashed? Mm-mm. Mm-mm. For somebody aspiring to get into real estate right now, what's some advice you would give them out the gate? Uh, one, I think the biggest mistake um, is that people go to Realtor.com and look to buy properties. Um, I look at real estate like I look at everything else. I don't want to pay retail price for anything. I don't care if it's a shirt, if it's a sneaker. I, I look at real estate like when you go to a sneaker store on the Ave or thing, you don't say $80, all right, here's 80. You still be like 75, 70. Same thing I look at real estate. I go to them sites where, whether it's auction.com or it's hubzoo.com, where it's foreclosed properties, they beat up, they look horrible, they look ugly. Those are the properties I want. I want bed bugs. I want shit all over the place. <laughs> I want heroin needles. I, you know, I, I've had crackheads in my house. I've had people sleep in there. You know, those are the houses that I want. I want boarded up. I want burnt down. Those are the houses I want. You know why? Because those are the houses nobody else wants, and I can get those for cheap. Because a house is like anything else. What is a house really? Nuts, bolts, sheetrock, pipes, plumbing, electric, roof. It's a house. Same thing. I buy my own supplies. I don't let a contractor buy my supplies. If, if you're a contractor, I pay you hourly. Like, mm -hmm. It's like anything else. If I come to you and I got the paint, I got the sheetrock, I got the roof, and all you got to do is put it together, what are you charging me for? You're charging me hourly to get it done. Right? If, if it's a house where it's rentals, all my houses look the same. I'm buying in bulk. All my houses are, are like a, a light gray. I'm buying gallons of light gray. I'm buying gallons of the cabinetry that look this color. A couple reasons why, it saves me a lot of money. And two, although Charlemagne says I'm Spanish, I'm not. So when Poppy, <laughs> when Poppy talks to me, I don't know what Poppy's saying. So Poppy knows gray, <laughs> cabinet, it's all the same color. <laughs> Your seminars, mm -hmm. big revenue source for you right now. Right. What makes your seminar different from any of the other seminars that are out there? For myself, you know, when you go to other seminars, you get somebody that talks. A lot of times the people that they say at the seminars are not even there. It's like a group of people that start the seminar, and then they say, if you want to meet whoever's on the marquee, it's going to cost you this much, and you got to come here. And so many people were hitting me like, yo, I spent 10000 at this seminar and learned nothing. I spent 30000 Can you please help me? And... Um, we did a seminar really just to piss those people off. We was like, you know what, let's do a seminar, but instead of getting people, let's help people. Let's bring a credit repair person to help people and talk to them about credit. Let's bring a, a conventional lender from a bank that gives people loans. Let's bring a hard money lender and explain what a hard money lender is. Let's bring an attorney that tells people why they should create an LLC. Let's bring an agent to tell them in what market they should look for for the property and where they should go. Let's bring auction.com, a place that people can go to to find houses. And not only that, they can talk to these people for free. So if you have a question for auction.com, they don't sit there and say, well, it's going to cost you an additional $1,000, honey. No. 
That's their job. If you're going to talk to the lender, if he can get you a loan, he's going to get you a loan. He's not going to say, here's 5000 to talk to you. Then what we do is, I, I, I do it like a, I say like Super Bowl. First half, you have the, the credit repair guy talking. You have the agent talking, the hard money lender, conventional lender, auction.com. Then we take a break. And then Caesar and I break down exactly what we do to do it. And we show pictures. We show the houses that we buy before, after, what we spend. And then we actually show the HUD of how much we actually spent and how much we actually make. So that way you know it's no bullshit. You can see it on the screen. And that's what we do. We pay for the venue. We pay for the flights. We pay for everybody to come to, for people to learn. And then the price that we charge, whether it's $99 or 129 that's it. There is no extra fee. No there is fees. no hidden fees. There is no upgrades. There's no up nothing. That's what you pay. And that's what you do. People say, well, you know, you, you're charging people. Yeah, because the venues are $40,000. Yeah, you're charging people. I got to fly everybody and pay for hotels. So that's what we do. And, you know, the goal of that, honestly, is to one day hopefully get like a Lowe's or, a, you know, a mortgage company or a Bank of America and say, you know what, Envy? I'm going to give you this money. Do this seminar and let people live for free. You know what I mean? I'm still not going to let people in for free, and I'm going to tell you why. If people do it for free, they'll be like, I'll be there at 3 o'clock. Then if it rains, they'll be like, ah, I couldn't fuck up my hair. But if you charge people even $19.99, they'll be there because now they have something invested into Correct. it. Correct. And I notice that with everybody. But that's what I want to do. I want to do it to a place where people don't get charged. They might get charged $19.99, and then when they come back, we give them back their $19.99. Something like that, but that's what that's what the goal is to find one of those big corporations to sponsor. Because all these big corporations say they want to help minorities get properties, get one of these big corporations and really put their their money where their mouth is. But that's the goal of the seminars. I'm gonna wrap, but I, I noticed that you keep going back to helping your people, helping your people. Mm -hmm. You're so invested in the community. Is that a product of your upbringing? Where did that come from? Um. Came from a lot of places. Not necessarily my upbringing. And the reason I, I wouldn't say it's not really my upbringing is because when I was being raised, I just wanted to get out. I wanted to make it. But then when I made it and I started making money, I realized so many of my people couldn't make it. And they couldn't make it because they didn't have the same opportunities as other people. They never learned about creating generational wealth. They never learned about making money. They never learned about how to get into real estate, where to put their money, what a 401k is. They never learned that. I never learned that. My parents never learned that. My parents' thing was they work 30 years of their life, they retire, and when they pass away, they leave whatever they had. That's not helping our generation, you know? We have to learn how to do these things. Like I tell my son, I don't care what you want to do in life. You want to be a garbage man, a sanitation worker, that's fine. But my job as a father is to make that a business. You want to be a sanitation worker? Great. Whatever makes you happy, son. But we're gonna, I'm going to teach you a business. We're going we're gonna to own a sanitation business. My daughter, she wants to do nails? Fine. I'm going to teach you how to open up a nail salon. These are the things that we need to learn how to do and teach our youth and teach our own community. And while I'm getting the knowledge, I could be a sucker and be like, nah, I'm not showing nobody. Mm -hmm. But I'd rather say, you know what, let me show you how. Let me teach you how to do it. Let me help you. Like I tell everybody, even if you don't come to my seminar, go get a book. Go, go try to get some experience. Look on YouTube. Try to learn something. You know what I mean? My seminar is easy because I bring everybody to you. But if you don't because you feel this, that, and the other, cool. But I want them to learn. And that's when I said I'm different from anybody else that you compare me to because I really invest myself in really trying to teach people how to do it. I'll have a, I won't have a conversation with a rapper that's trying to rap in my ear. But if somebody sits there and says, yo, E, I'm in the real estate and this was my plan and this was my business and this is what I did, I'll sit there and have an hour conversation with you if I can help you. Because I want people to think about outside of just one profession. I want you to have a job working at Home Depot and be like, yo, E, how can I get my income tax to turn this into something else? And I'll sit there and try to help you as much as I can. You know, but that's what I really try to do. It seems like your light, your eyes light up. 
your, your spirit comes alive when you speak about real estate. Do you still have that same love for music? Yes and no. Um, nothing's better than that radio. To this day? To this day. You know what it is? Because it's like being in a barbershop and having a conversation with my boys and we just talking shit. Yeah, people are sensitive now about things that you say, but it's still being able to have that conversation. There's nothing better than going to a club and you see somebody having a fucked up day. Maybe she just broke up with a man or he just broke up with his girl or it's her birthday and you can change their feeling. You can put a glow on their face. Nothing is better than those two feelings, you know? So I still have that love for, for music. I just don't have the love for before. Before I wanted to be in the studio, I wanted to find the next rapper and this, that, and the other. But now I just feel like everybody sounds the same. Everybody wants to be the same. Nobody wants to be different. Before there was a Nas, there was a J, there was a DMX, there was a Nelly, there was a Lil Wayne. There was all these different types of artists. There was an Outkast, a T.I. Now it seems like everybody wants to be like this and everybody wants to look like this, you know? Nas had a fade with a half part. Jay had a flat top. You know, this one had dreads. Now it seems like everybody's like, I want to be like that. You know, how many, how many people do you see that look like the Migos? Everybody wants to look like the Migos or everybody wants to look like this and it's like, there's no more originality. There's no more personality. There's no more, I just want to be myself. Wow. What's the best advice you ever received? Um, I think it was my wife's mother. And that's the only thing that, that I'm always upset about in this world. When nobody believed, not even my parents at first, because my parents just wanted me to get a job. Oh, you just went to you just went to college. I want you to get a job with a hat. That was my mom's thing. Get a job with a hat. <laughs> you have life insurance. You have health insurance. Gia's mom was the only one that said, uh, "Do it. What do what makes you happy." And I was like, "I'm DJing." She was like, "I don't care." She was like, "If you want to DJ and I can support you, I'll I'll support you. I don't care." Do what makes you happy. When everybody else was telling me, oh, you can't be a DJ, you can't do that, and you can't do this, she was the only one that said, do what makes you happy. And the reason why I say it hurts my heart is because she, had, she has dementia <clears throat> for, like, uh, for like seven years. And it bothers me because she doesn't remember. Uh. She doesn't remember now. So she doesn't get to enjoy. Even her grandkids, she doesn't get to enjoy. She doesn't get to enjoy the fruits of our labor and all that other stuff. Like, I remember I took her to Dubai. We took her to Dubai. She, fl she flew first class. We got back. And you say, Mama, how you like Dubai? Dubai? The backyard was great. She oh. just doesn't know. And I just wish she, that she would experience and really understood that. That trip to Dubai, you took everybody first class. I take everybody everywhere. Mm -hmm. That money is real, eh? I work hard. I work <laughs> I hard. I love it. What's the worst advice you ever received? Worst advice I ever received. Um, probably would be uh, Power 105 one is going to be a sinking ship and don't leave Hot 97. I think that was probably the worst advice and I'm glad I didn't listen. Can I ask who gave it to you? A lot of people. <laughs> Definitely Ebro though. <laughs> Definitely Ebro. You know, it's funny, you know, people think me and Ebro, uh, our enemies that hate each other, but I did radio with him and, and he was one of those dudes that always supported me and always had my back. But he definitely told me that Power 105 was a sinking ship and that and, and stay at Hot 97. It's my guy though. Got you. Looking back, what advice would you give to your 21 year old self? My 21 year old self was still in college because I did five years in college. I ain't do four. I'm not even front. But one, I would say, take full advantage of the college experience. I was one of the people that was in and out. I just did it to get a C or a B minus and get the fuck out. I didn't necessarily take it serious like I should. I mean, because college, you pay for college and there's so many things that you can do, so many classes that you can take, and I didn't. So I'm mad I didn't take full advantage of that. And two, I'm also mad that it took me a lot longer to think about investing and pushing, and I didn't do it earlier. I should have been doing what I'm doing then, now. Instead of buying trucks with spinning rims and TVs and jewelry and 
all types of stupid things. I mean, I got, I must have about 70 jerseys that are 5Xs and things like that. But I wish in Jordans that, you know, and sneakers that turn yellow mm -hmm. after four years. So I wish I would have took a lot of that money and really invested and really planned that part out of it. I planned my career, but I never planned the money part out until later on. That's actually great advice. Mm -hmm. Give it up for this week's Power Move maker, DJ Envy. What's up, guys? Thanks for sticking with me to the end of the video. Truly appreciate you. If you like anything you heard here today, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And if you know anybody that can benefit from this message, feel free to share. Peace and love.